Bootleg by McManus. Wants to go downfield. Has pressure coming. Gets the pass away. Dumps it. Hits caught. Willis drops back. Blitz coming. Fakes one time. Now drops back and throws the post. Deep. He's got a wide open receiver. Touchdown. Pitch. Weldon will sprint out to his right and throw his first pass. Touchdown, Abejo! Chanel scrambled away from the pressure. Throws to the end zone. And a Charlie runs to his right. Charlie may hit the angle. 5 3 2 1. Touchdown, Charlie Ward! Touchdown, Charlie Ward! In the battle for gridiron supremacy, no other player on the field is as important as the quarterback. It takes a man of particular mindset to play the position well. He must possess both the fire necessary to inspire his team and the cool to remain detached and analytical. He must have the strength to throw the ball 60 yards downfield. Touchdown, catch Terry Anthony. Pops the arm, now he wants to go long. Downfield, he's got Dorsey, wide open. He makes the catch of the fair 20, to the 15, to the 10. It is a Florida State touchdown. And the touch to feather a short screen pass over outstretched hands. Ward takes the snap. Play action. Rush looks. Pops out of the pocket. Runs to his left. Throws it downfield. It is caught by John. He's got the burst down to the 40. Down to the 50. Down to the side. Down to the 40. Down to the 30. He separates. He must stare adversity right in the face and respond with the strongest conviction. Shotgun snap. Danny Cannell rolls to his right, throws to his right. It is caught. It's caught. Touchdown. There's the snap. Play action by Cannell looking. Hey, Cannell's going to roll. 3 2 1. Touchdown. With the split second intuition and imagination necessary to disregard one action and try another. As glamorous and exciting as it looks, playing quarterback is definitely no day at the beach. Swift, powerful linebackers, 300-plus pound defensive linemen, and constantly blitzing safeties are always looking to separate the quarterback from both ball and senses. Peering down from his perch above the Florida State practice fields, Bobby Bowden's eye never wanders far from the quarterback position. He watches them more than anyone else because that's where it all starts. Bowden ought to know. A former college quarterback himself, he's helped tutor some of the greatest quarterbacks in Florida State history. 344, Zebra X corner. Safety plays way back, hits your square end. If he comes up tight, we no, go to the top. In 1964, Bowden was an assistant under head coach Bill Peterson when Steve Tensey set the early standard for Seminole signal callers and led FSU to its first victory over the Florida Gators. To 1993, when a Heisman Trophy winner with a golden arm and fleet feet crossed the threshold from sport to art when he led the tribe to the national title. In between and beyond, there have been numerous quarterbacks who weathered the storms and sat by patiently waiting for their moment in the sun. Florida State University and Universal Sports America are proud to give you a look back at these great leaders in the first in a series of Garnet and Gold Seminoles.
The Bill Peterson era at Florida State University was known for its flashy passing and versatile quarterbacks. Three standout Seminole signal callers took turns rewriting the school's record book. The first was towering Cincinnati prep star Steve Tensey. At six foot five, Tensey stood as the nation's tallest quarterback from 1962 to 64. Although touted as a great passer with an extremely strong arm, Tensey would have to patiently wait to take his turn at leading the Seminoles. As a junior in 1963, he started the first six games, including the Tribe's 24 to nothing victory over Miami, where he outdueled the Canes' highly touted George Myra. Eventually, Tensey lost that starting position and would be forced to bide his time. Although Tensey was patient in waiting, he wasn't patient with himself. Tensey was his own biggest critic and would constantly get mad when he hadn't done things exactly correct. By the time his senior season ended in 1964, Tensey would set several career passing marks, including every single season passing category. Tensey teamed with fellow Florida State Hall of Famer Fred Belitnikoff on many of his throws as the duo combined to become one of the most feared tandems in college football. We started building a, a passing game, and uh, finally when we got the right personnel in Tensey and, and Blutenkopf, it was like stealing, really. And so I think that really did help the Florida State get recognized. Tensey quarterback the Tribe to a 9-1-1 mark in 1964, including an emotional first ever victory against arch rival Florida and the school's biggest bowl victory yet versus Oklahoma. His five TD passes on that day set a new Gator Bowl record, a record which still stands today. I guess he's the first quarterback to put Florida State on the map as a passing quarterback. Bill Peterson was the head coach, and he had, he had inserted the pro-type offense, one of the first to ever insert that in college football. And Steve Tensey uh, took, it, took it to a new level, really, in throwing the football. Tensey's path to maturity was worth the wait for Seminole faithful, as he led the Seminoles to their first ever final top 10 finish and a place among our top 10. Bill Peterson and his upscale passing attack set even higher standards toward the end of his tenure at Florida State. From 1967 to 69, the Seminoles were the only team to be ranked in the top 10 of the national passing charts each year. Their consistency paid off in big dividends, and the two quarterbacks that produced these statistics were Kim Hammond and Bill Kappelman. Intelligence, heart, skill, hard work, and patience are all the qualities that made Kim Hammond a great quarterback. His success story is a great lesson for any other athlete. After three years as a red shirt and reserve, Hammond got his first start in the second game of the 1967 season, his senior year. Eight games later, he was an All-American, had finished fifth in the Heisman Trophy balloting, and was the MVP of the Gator and Senior Bowls. Hammond was a fine all-round athlete with great size and speed. I was given a little more uh, opportunity to do the quarterback draw, occasionally option, and run the ball. 
And uh, I think that kind of added a little different dimension to my style as compared to Steve Tinsey's. Although given earlier unsuccessful chances to solidify his position, Kim got his chance in the first game of 1967 and never looked back. With less than seven minutes remaining in the 67 season opener with Houston, Hammond came off the bench to complete 15 passes, two for touchdowns, against the highly touted Cougar defense. One week later, he led the Tribe to a 37-37 tie against offending national champion Alabama in an epic struggle versus Tide QB, Kenny Stabler. Kim Hammond just picked him to death, you know. He really uh, was reading the keys real good. Uh, Alabama didn't know how to stop the passing game. After that ball game, I realized that I could compete with in, certainly in the passing game and maybe in a variety of other ways with just about any quarterback in the country. The 67 season ended on a high note as Hammond shook off the cobwebs from an early injury and led the Knowles to a late touchdown as FSU beat the Gators in Gainesville for the first time ever. He ended his brilliant career by rewriting the Gator Bowl record books with 37 completions in 53 attempts for a 362-yard day and a 17-17 tie with Penn State. Both his attempts and completions remain records today. Trailing by 17 at the half, Hammond had the patience to mount a stirring second-half comeback. His patience throughout his career allowed him to grow into one of FSU's top quarterbacks. Kappelman's Florida State career is a story of persistence and courage. Acknowledged as a man with a golden arm from the time of his arrival on campus, he unfortunately found it difficult to prove himself as a leader early on. In 1967, he found himself watching and learning behind Kim Hammond and off-injured Gary Padgett. I recognized his potential right away. I felt that when uh, Bill learned the system and learned to execute, that he would become a very, very successful quarterback. In 1968, the scene was again similar. Kappelman was the early leader for the starting position, but his trouble learning to read opposing defenses hindered his cause. Pagic returned from arm surgery and was the starter for the opening game against Maryland. As luck would have it, Pagic would be injured and Kappelman would get a second chance. Redemption could not have come more quickly. Kappelman was the second in a long line of Florida State quarterbacks who weren't afraid to put it up at any time in any situation. No game can better testify to this than his 508-yard passing performance against Memphis State. The mark still ranks number one today in FSU passing charts. When his career ended in 1969, Bill ranked in the top three in most FSU career passing categories. His 25 TD passes in 1968 helped to give the Seminoles 29 on the season, a figure which led the nation. Throughout Kappelman's two seasons at the helm, the Seminole offense averaged a remarkable two touchdown passes per game. Few have come further from the first day of their career to the last than Bill Kappelman.
Gary Huff had all the physical tools to be a great college quarterback. Height, vision, arm strength, and running ability. In fact, he seemed to have an instinctive ability to avoid oncoming linemen. When Huff arrived on campus, he came to Tallahassee as much for the Seminoles baseball program as he did football. Coming out of high school, I was probably a better baseball player than a football player. But I knew that Bill Peterson had a commitment to throw the ball. He was going to put Florida State on the map and do something better than anybody did in the country. In 1970, as a third string quarterback, he landed his nickname of Huff, the Magic Dragon. Huff, the Magic Dragon in a game versus UF. The Gators led 38 to seven with less than seven minutes left when the coaching staff turned to Huff. The sophomore passed for three TDs in the face-saving final score. In that brief time, Huff went eight for 15 for 230 yards. From that moment, the scene shifts ahead to a beautiful montage. A brilliant blur of precise passes infrequent but precise scrambles, clairvoyant audibles at the line of scrimmage, and 20 wins over the next two and a half seasons. I was brought up uh, under the old school, you know, drop back quarterback, uh, a good quarterback stayed in the pocket, waited to the last minute, relied it on his, uh, his lineman to hold off. Uh, the rush, and uh, you had to have a personality that you could take punishment. Huff's courage became a great trademark, suffering from a severely separated shoulder, which kept him from practicing. Huff still played every play of every offensive series against the University of Florida. Against Georgia Tech, he again played every play despite suffering from an intestinal virus that allowed him to consume only honey and soft drinks for four days. In 1971, he would lead the tribe to the inaugural Fiesta Bowl. By the time the 72 season finished, Huff was third in the nation in total offense and would carve his name into the Seminole record book like no other quarterback. Huff owned every single season and career passing mark the Seminoles had to offer. He became only the third player in history of college football at that time to account for more than 52 touchdowns. A quarterback uh, usually has a pretty big ego, extreme amount of confidence. And um, I think that, that I could go out there right now if you put me in the shotgun and win nine games for Bobby. And uh, I'll probably be leaning on a cane one day saying the same thing. As a senior in 1972, Huff wore helmets as a Seminole football and baseball star. However, it was as a quarterback where he became the top passer in the college game. became known as the two-headed quarterback, and their legend is as much a part of Florida State's football rise as Bobby Bowden's trick plays. Road wins at Nebraska. And Chief Osceola and Renegade. Upon their arrival on campus, FSU was thought by most to still be an all-girls school the sort of team that would be an excellent sacrificial lamb in between crucial conference games. However, from 1977 to 79, Jimmy Jordan and Wally Woodham were part of a strategic development so successful, it basically put Florida State on the football map. Wally Woodham uh, is one of the most accurate passers we've had at Florida State and uh, one of the best leaders we've had at Florida State. 
he had ultimate confidence in his ability. Jimmy was, he was a hardball pitcher. He could throw the ball by you. He, he, you, give him a, you give him a foot opening on a receiver, he put it right there. Both men were homegrown legends from Tallahassee Leon High School, and that's where their unusual relationship began. We liked to hunt, and we, and we did some other things together. I guess get out on the town at night a little bit, but we'd, we liked to do things like that. We were good friends and knew a lot about each other's families and all that, and it, it was almost like a, a brother type thing. Both took the field in Seminole country as sophomores in 1977, the second year of the Bobby Bowden era. From their first game that season at Southern Mississippi, where Jordan started and Woodham finished, their careers would be distinctly parallel. Over the next three seasons, Bowden alternated the two like a gunfighter switching pistols. Whichever quarterback had the hottest hand at the time would start, the other would relieve. When one got in trouble or couldn't find the mark, the other was there for the rescue. It was nearly like baseball is played today, where you have a starter and you have a, a middle round guy and you have a finisher. One of them would get on a roll and, le and start for maybe four games in a row. Then the other one would get on a roll and he'd start for three games in a row. Wally started and threw a touchdown right off the bat. And then he had a couple bad drives and he was gone. And I ended up making a few things happen here or there and we ended up blowing them out. In 1979, the Seminoles went undefeated for the first time in major college football. Of course, without the heroics of the two-headed QB, it wouldn't have been possible. The relationship, I don't think it happened again. It was just a perfect situation as far as uh, personalities. That 79 season, what I remember most from it was we continued to build what they have now. The success of the two-headed quarterback would not have happened if the timing wasn't right. Two great friends and competitors rose together for the benefit of one team.
The late 1980s brought unprecedented success for Bobby Bowden in Florida State, thanks in no small part to a string of exceptional quarterbacks, beginning with Danny McManus. He was very quick, had a quick release, he had a lot of confidence, uh, great natural leadership ability, and uh, he could do everything you wanted a quarterback to do in college. The guys really rallied around, especially the offensive line, they just seemed to love him. I think the team as a whole really believed in him. As gifted a leader as he was a passer, the Seminoles emerged to national prominence with Danny at the helm. His never say die attitude created a lasting impression on Seminole football and ranks him among the school's top 10 quarterbacks. He said, well, I, I'm all right. He said, I'm just a little dizzy. I got hit out oh, there. Oh, we can't afford to lose the game. I know it. I what know do you that. Think? He's blown formation. He only he blew right. one formation, then he fumbled a snap. Other than that, everything's all right. Let's give one more series. Well, you keep your eye on him. Yes, I mean, it's important right. here we don't play this ballgame. Right. Then you think you're okay, huh, buddy? I think so. Okay. It's very important now if you're not, yeah. to be honest with me. Yeah? I will, I will. In a career frequently interrupted by injuries, McManus was always at his best in the big games. He typified the words leader and winner as the Knowles went 19-2 in games that he started at quarterback. In 1987, McManus quarterback one of the most successful teams in FSU history, passing for over 1,900 yards. McManus to throw. Looks to his left, throws toward the end zone, and Fenwick Carter, touchdown! He got it! He got it! Touchdown for the Knowles! On the way to an 11 and 1 finish and then record number 2 national ranking, McManus led the tribe to a road win over previously unbeaten Auburn. McManus on a quick drop, looks has plenty of time, looks across the toward the end zone. It is caught by Gator. Touchdown Florida State. And broke the Gators' 6 year stranglehold with a resounding victory in Gainesville. McManus hands off to Dane Williams. Touchdown. But McManus will forever be remembered for one offensive series that established the Knowles as a true national power. Trailing Nebraska in the waning moments of the 1988 Fiesta Bowl, Danny led FSU on an historic 97-yard touchdown drive, capped by one great play. The drive in the Nebraska game kind of maybe set a precedent for the guys to come to really realize, hey, it's not over. You know, you, you guys can't quit. And we've had some great comeback games, you know, since that time. The stirring come from behind victory over Nebraska was capped with McManus receiving game MVP honors and started the Seminoles' current string of consecutive top four finishes. A fitting end to a brilliant career places Danny McManus in the annals of Florida State greatness. Peter Tom Willis might have shown more resilience on his path to the Seminole quarterback position than any other player. As a skinny freshman, Willis impressed coaches with his intelligence and fight, but it would take a while before he would get to display those talents on the field. Peter Tom came in and came in at the same time Chip Ferguson did, and, and, uh, and Chip got the first break. I knew he'd play because when we we got in the meeting room, he picked things up extremely quick. Willis would get just one start during his junior season and would make the most of it. 37, all the time he needs. High toward the end zone and holding on. Dossie in as receivers. They're looking across the middle and Dossie. A fake to the fullback, rolling as Willis. However, after a fine performance at South Carolina, he would again be relegated to sitting on the bench. 
After waiting those four years for the starting position, PT made the most of his 1989 opportunity, breaking 14 records en route to the most successful single season by any QB in school history to that point. I guess you crave as an athlete is to be, um, be the person that your teammates look to to make plays. And, um, you know, that, that was something that, that was special to me, to be able to be able to be out there making the plays. For Willis, 1989 would get off to a rocky start as the Knowles dropped their first two contests. However, as Willis matured and kept improving, so did the Seminoles. By season's end, many believed Florida State was the best team in the country, and a big reason was PT. I'm Pete, and we're the QBs. We got the best job, as you can see. Because we get to lead the offense attack. Then watch the defense get the ball back. But if you get lucky and we can't run through, we'll just unload some passes on you. No matter what you do, we're going to score. And if you make us mad, we'll, we'll score, score some more. With each game, his passing numbers began to climb. Quick snap, play fake by Peter Tom Willis. Wants to go upstairs for all of it. He's got Anthony at the eighth. Anthony spins away. He'll score a Florida State touchdown. 301 yards at LSU. From the 30, Willis to go airborne on first down. Plenty of protection. Far sideline has a receiver. Touchdown, Lawrence Fossey. 324 versus Tulane. First down, Florida State. Willis inside. Touchdown. 362 versus South Carolina. And look at the fake by Willis, cranking it up deep. And it's caught. And a remarkable 482 versus Memphis State. In fact, Willis passed for a record three straight 300 plus yard passing games during the year. In between, Willis led the Seminoles to victories over the eventual national champion Miami and highly touted Auburn. Play fake Willis under pressure, gets the pass away. He's got a receiver, Dossie, inside the 25 to the 20. In the season finale versus Florida, he established new FSU single season records for total offense, completions, and passing yards while throwing for his sixth 300 yard game. A fine career. Climaxed with a five touchdown, 422 yard MVP performance as FSU whipped Nebraska in the Fiesta Bowl. And Peter Tom Willis has thrown for five. Peter Tom Willis waited five years before getting his shot at leading the Florida State Arsenal. And when all was said and done, he proved he was well worth the wait.
native of Tallahassee, Casey Weldon was truly a hometown hero who won over the fans with a combination of exceptional talent and great design. Weldon capped a great senior season by winning the Johnny Unitas Award and finishing as runner-up in the Heisman vote. He had plenty of arm, he moved well, he moved better than your, your normal quarterback. I mean, he was one of the few guys that, you know, you could cross the line of scrimmage and do some damage as a runner. It was a career that might not have taken place if it wasn't for his patience and his belief in his own abilities. Weldon wouldn't get his chance until the fifth game of the 1990 season against the Miami Hurricanes. Brad Johnson, who would go on to become one of the Seminoles' most successful NFL quarterbacks, struggled to move the tribe's offense. Weldon would come in to relieve and never relinquish the position again. Casey and I were best friends, and um, we came in. It was kind of unique with us because every quarterback that ever been here at Florida State, they always had a year or two years in between them. Through it all, the, the battles that we both had, being the same year, trying to be the starting quarterback, and uh, like I said, it was a coin toss. And uh, I got lucky and won that one, and now he's, he's beat me in the NFL. He's tearing it up, and, uh, but just the friendship that we kept and made you know, here is, uh, is probably the one, is pro it is the most special thing I got out of the FSU. I think we made each other better uh, because we saw each other work in the summertime. Um, we threw with each other. From the start of his senior season, Weldon battled both the pressure of being ranked number one throughout most of the year, as well as the pressure of opposing defensive linemen. Unfortunately for Weldon, his body deteriorated behind a young and inexperienced offensive line. Starts to break down. He'll be hit, almost the football. 5.24 left to go in the ball game. Casey's shaken up, and he's going to come to the sideline and walk very slowly. But along the way, Weldon's finest hour as the Seminole leader came on a warm September afternoon in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Here's Weldon looking, throws the ball. It is a lateral to Charlie Ward. Trick play right back across the field to Weldon. Weldon's got the ball. He'll run. Oh boy. Weldon to the 30-yard line. Weldon to the 20-yard line. Weldon to the 15. Now, seven, dropping. Weldon throws it over the middle. Warren Hart, he's got the catch. Touchdown, Florida State. On this great college football day in 1991, Weldon directed the Seminoles' near-perfect offense to 51 points in a victory over the third-ranked Michigan Wolverines. Looks to his right, throws the ball toward the end zone, toward Terrell, diving catch from the 10. Weldon, play fakes, rolls to his right, drops, throws the pass toward the end zone, touchdown FSU! What a play by Weldon! Lonnie Johnson takes it in, and Weldon waited till the last second to fire the pass, and he was hit as he released. Weldon is having a Heisman Trophy day, too. The mark was the single most points ever scored by an opponent at Michigan's home. All in all, Weldon led the Seminole offense by throwing for over 2,500 yards and 22 touchdowns in leading the Tribe to an 11-win season and fourth-place finish. Weldon's will to win ultimately outlasted his body during his career. But through all the pain, he remained one of the hardest workers in school history. Consistency. It's the mark of true excellence in any endeavor. In the case of Danny Cannell, consistency is what an excellent college career was founded on. Danny was a classic drop back passer with great accuracy, but he wouldn't put up the great numbers of his predecessor, Charlie Ward, and would have to live with the constant comparisons to the former Heisman winner. Cannell would finally emerge from the shadows of Ward to be selected as the 1995 ACC Player of the Year. The Fort Lauderdale native threw 31 touchdowns during his senior campaign to put him atop both the ACC and Florida State's list for touchdowns in a season. His 57 career touchdown throws ranks him as the Seminoles' all-time leader. 
had great size. He was, uh, you know, at least six foot four, maybe a little more. Um, 225 pounds probably by the time he left and had a very good arm, very accurate. Despite all the fine statistics Cannell managed to amass throughout his Seminole career, he'll best be remembered for his cool under pressure and young innocence. As the special teams holder for Scott Bentley in the 1993 National Championship game, Danny helped ease the pressure on the freshman kicker by instructing Bentley to jump into his arms after he kicked the game winner. He knew that picture would soon grace the cover of every magazine and television set in the country. In the middle of the storm, he was the calm. Bentley kicked the game winner. And guess what picture was seen all over the country? Two very emotional comebacks also proved that ice water did indeed run through his veins. Trailing 31-3 in the fourth quarter against bitter rival Florida, Cannell orchestrated the largest fourth quarter comeback in the history of college football. To his right, it is caught! It's caught! That's the goal from two and a half yards away. Cannell awaits. Here's the snap. Play action by Cannell looking. Hey, Cannell's going to run. Three, two, one. Touchdown, Florida State! That was a game that really, for all intents and purposes, was over. Um, I think a lot of guys had thrown in the towel. I know the lot, a lot of the fans had thrown in the towel. And um, I'd have probably left at halftime if I didn't have to coach the second half. But uh, you look at that second half of that Florida game, and there, there's probably not a finer performance of any QB in a half than, than what he did that day since, you know, I've been at Florida State. Twice he managed to snatch victory from the arms of Notre Dame's Lou Holtz. The first time came in 1994. And again in the 1996 Orange Bowl. FSU found themselves trailing by 12 points, this time with 11 minutes remaining. A dramatic fourth quarter comeback was ignited by two Canal touchdown passes for the win. As gracious as he was humble, Cannell etched his name alongside the other Seminole greats. Try to do it himself. Touchdown! The weapon he fashioned was to become known as the fast break offense. As the trigger man, Charlie Ward ran roughshod over the college football world, 
in winning the school's first Heisman Trophy. The results of his play so devastated the Seminoles' opponents during his senior year that Ward almost made it look like child's play. He was one of the hardest quarterbacks to rush probably in the history of college football. I've seen some others like him. But when he go back in that pocket, you didn't know where to rush him or not. Because if you flushed him, he might kill you. He's the consummate of what you would like to have in a quarterback, mobility and an arm. I'm the type of guy who don't want to end in the spotlight. I like to show that I'm just part of a team, and my teammates deserve a lot of the credit. And it just so happened that I'm the quarterback and get all the attention, and I just have to accept that. The FSU no-huddle attack gave an opponent precious little time to react and put Ward behind the reins of the most feared offense in the nation. He liked the tempo, maybe, maybe a basketball tempo, you know, nobody standing around, no huddling. He liked uh, the fact that everybody was spread out. He liked the fact that he was a little bit farther removed from the blitz and linebackers or whatever might be coming at him. Numerous school records fell along the way. He's got a touchdown for In 1993, Ward directed a dazzling offense, which averaged 42.4 points, 325 passing yards, 548 total yards, and 30 first downs a game. Touchdown, Florida State. I'm not really confident about what the things that I can do, but you know, once I get started and put my feet in, then I think, you know, I feel as though I can do anything. Each time the six foot one quarterback took a snap, the Knowles gained an average of seven yards of play. Fire, fire at the 40, fire at the 35, 30, 25, 20. The senior, with quick feet and even quicker reaction time, set school records with 27 touchdown passes, 264 completions. 69.5% completion percentage, fewest interceptions, and he ranks second all time with 3,032 passing yards. While posting those amazing statistics, Ward became the most decorated player in the history of college football. By leading the Seminoles to their first national championship, Ward literally won every award he was eligible for as the Seminole Field General. The winner of the 1993 Davey O'Brien National Quarterback Award is from Florida State University, Charlie Ward. The 1993 Toyota Leader of the Year is none other than Charlie Ward. the winner of the 57th annual Maxwell Football Club Award as the College Player of the Year with the record 83% of the ballots going to him, Charlie Ward, Florida State University. The winner of the 1993 John W. Heisman Memorial Trophy awarded to the best college football player in the country. And that winner, is Charlie Ward of Florida State University. his career by setting 19 school and seven ACC offensive records during his two seasons. In addition to becoming FSU's all-time offensive leader with 6,600 yards, Ward had the highest completion rate for a career with a 62.3% clip and the lowest interception percentage, 
a mere 2.9. Charlie looks to his right, comes back, runs into his own blocker, now goes back to his right, directing traffic. He'll run with the football, Charlie Ward to the 50, Charlie to the 45, Charlie to the 40, Charlie splits Clippers to the 30-yard line. Charlie Ward, remarkable run. Ward, who wore number 17 during his career, became one of just five Seminoles in history to have his number retired. The jersey number 17 will never be worn again by any Florida State football player. The greatest player to ever wear the garnet and gold, Charlie Ward defines greatness at the quarterback position. As Bobby Bowden himself will tell you, no quarterback can succeed without a great supporting cast. It takes a team effort from blockers, runners, and receivers to make an offense go. With those ingredients in place, the FSU football program has built a rich tradition of success through hard work and determination. Florida State has risen to the upper echelon of college football riding the arms of these great garnet and gold Seminoles. <laughs>